Hello, and welcome to an ep another episode of Talking with the Experts. My name's Mike Nichols, and I'm the content and social media manager for AEM. Today, I've got Ben Toomey with me to talk about a concept that might be new to some of our listeners. It's called collaborative resilience. But before we get into that, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Ben. So he hails from Brisbane, Australia, and he recently joined AEM as our director of product management for Global Wildfire Solutions or bushfire, as they would say, down in Australia. Is that right, Ben? That's right. <laughs> and we're lucky to have him. Uh, for over two decades, he's been leading the development of decision support solutions across a whole variety of industries, uh, focused on predictive analytics and applied simulation. Uh, he's been an active volunteer firefighter, boots on the ground, for more than a decade. And he continues to serve his uh, community as a volunteer brigade officer and a senior fire behavior analyst for Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. Uh, since 2015, he's been architecting and building wildfire risk and predictive analytic systems with unique solutions to guide wildfire response, preparedness, and prevention decisions, both for Queensland Fire and Emergency Services and in the commercial sector. So Ben, again, thank you for being here. Really do appreciate it. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Mark. So, Ben, why don't we just start off by explaining to our viewers what we mean when we talk about this concept of collaborative resilience? Yeah, sure. So I think one of the things that drew me to AEM uh, is its global vision and commitment to helping communities and organizations to become more resilient in the face of increasing natural hazards. And that ethos really aligns with mine, like in the background you've just outlined with my volunteering and stuff like that. Um, so. You know, it aligns with my own intent to create tools uh, for people to create enhanced resilience uh, and, you know, make a measurable difference in the world. And so if we think about what resilience means in a disaster risk context or a disaster risk reduction context, it's basically the ability for individuals or communities and states to adapt and recover from hazards. So by hazards, you know, shocks and stresses, I mean cyclones, hurricanes, uh, wildfires, earthquakes, etc., etc. Now, we structure our societies in hierarchies, right? So we've got federal, state, local governments and things like that. But natural hazards don't conform to those. They don't really care about where we put our boundaries and what we consider to be our areas of responsibility. So to be truly effective, I think, in disaster resilience planning, it needs to be done collaboratively between organisations as well as just within them. And currently, the ability for organisations next to each other or those that kind of share uh, a common risk, um, for them to create common risk pictures and plan cooperatively, uh, it's extremely limited. But it's widely desired, and having worked with lots of local governments in particular and, and many forestry organisations and others who particularly share wildfire risk, this is a really needed sort of set of capabilities. So our hierarchies work great for budgets and laws, but they tend to work against themselves when it comes to that horizontal collaboration between organisations. And so AEM's concept of collaborative resilience is going to enable Disaster managers, planners, responders who work in those individual organisations um, to actually collaborate between neighbouring organisations and start to connect and share and self-organise, if you like, because I think that resilience is a team sport and it's currently being played by a team with no coach <laughs> or no structured teamwork. And to get this collaborative resilience thing working well, um, it's going to change the way that the resilience game is played, and I'm excited to be a part of it. That's great, Ben. Thank you. Um, I would imagine information sharing would be kind of at the heart of that. Uh, maybe you could give us an example of what that might be looking at. Sure, Mike. Um, so I think if we take wildfire as an example, and this does apply to all hazards, but we'll pick wildfire um, hypothetically. So for an organization to effectively prevent or reduce the impacts of, say, future wildfires, Firstly, it needs a clear understanding of that longer-term wildfire risk and to plan risk reduction activities, so things like prescribed burns and fire breaks and, and other activities based on that risk. Now, the trouble is usually the risk picture um, 
so that's where the fuel is, how much of it there is, and, and similar things to that. That spans not just my organization's area of responsibility, but those around me as well. So, for example, fires might need to burn through, say, a national park and a water catchment before they get to my area of responsibility. The risk reduction activities then that the national parks people employ and that the water catchment people employ, they're going to really change my risk planning. And right now, there's no easy cross-organisation visibility of those things. So there's no systematic way for us to do that collectively and do it together. So the overarching need, I reckon, is for this common view of risk and hazards and the ability to coordinate with those who share that risk. So in this case, it would be with the national parks and with the water catchment people. Um, and this doesn't just apply to long-term risk, by the way, so not looking you know, a long way ahead to the wildfires, but also all phases of the disaster management process, so prevention, preparedness, detection, response and recovery. And it applies to all hazards, right? Not just not just wildfire. So an example of collaborative resilience in this context would be all three of these organizations self-organizing and working together in a single system. And then they can curate and track uh, a program of their risk reduction activities collectively. Um, and that's going to result in a better outcome than if they all did it on their own. So deploying state of the art locally detailed risk and predictive layers across that event curve for different hazards is really hard. Um, it takes bringing together lots of different types of environmental sensors from weather stations, feeding weather forecast models, lightning sensors, cameras with AI ignition detection for that detection component. Um, this all has to be systematically brought together in ways that drive proactive decision making and planning and driving the right response decisions all the way through to public early warning systems by systematically sharing the benefits of all of that between exposed organizations there's going to be without doubt a really synergistic effect in improved resilience great ben that's that's so i mean that's a great idea in the abstract but i mean how do you pull something like that off in practice i mean uh, you've got all this information coming at you the decision maker from all these different angles um, what is the thing you still call analysis paralysis? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's a good point, right? This is, like I said, this is really hard stuff. Um, and you actually have to bring together quite a different number of facets uh, from good decision science through to good design, uh, information structures and information management. There's a bunch of different things. So if you, you're right. If you had to look separately at, you know, dozens or many tens of different data sources uh, and make sense of all of that on the fly, you're going to have real trouble, and you would. You would suffer from this analysis paralysis. But there's techniques and approaches that can minimise this, and we're certainly following those. So firstly, choosing effective information management structures. Now, what they are really is how we organise content in you know, clearly understandable ways, libraries, categories, subcategories, the way we approach presenting and organising this information uh, is going to be really important to make that problem easier. Um, then there's the concept of allowing people to drill for more information as decision makers need it. Um, so that's really critical. So in other words, what we try to do is let users stay at the highest level to make their decision making. But if they need to, then they can drill down for more detail if required. That way you don't overload people with the first lot of information that they, that they get. Then there's the concept of combining and refining multiple layers into something that's more simplified. So where you've got lots of sources coming together, we can simplify and categorise those layers into something simple. And then instead of looking at dozens of different sources, you've got consolidated information from all of those sources into one layer. And that we can turn into actionable insights more easily. So you get the benefit of an enriched data set without getting bogged down in the tedious process of doing your own compiling and analysing all of those layers. That's why I think it's about more than just sharing and source data layers. Right? So lots of people produce layers, 
Um, it's got to be a lot more than that. It's got to be about how we bring those layers together and make it simple. And then it's about, given that it's simple and we can action it, how do we share this with other players so that we get uh, an overall better outcome than just the, the single parts? So it matters how the information is combined, simplified and presented. It makes sense, Ben. It, it makes sense to me. But it, it kind of sounds like you're talking about a unicorn, right? There's the central ap application. It consolidates all of this different information in really easy to use way and then lets you drill down exactly when you need to. I mean, are we talking about just this hypothetical entity or is it something that actually exists? No, nope, that's a good question. This is actually something that actually exists and we're making it better day by day. So there's lots of tools out there now that enable combining data layers. But until recently, there hasn't been anything available that brings together real-time environmental data, you know, the forecast data, the risk data, in a way that also enables this collaborative resilience concept, so cross-organisation collaboration. Using the principles that we just talked about and how we simplify the information and how we make that much more accessible and actionable by the user. Our answer to all of that, uh, and, and it's what I would consider a profound capability gap in resilience planning, is what we're calling AEM Elements 360. So that is our flagship platform that is going to enable this concept to be rolled out. And it easily integrates data from uh, in-house sources, so uh, things that um, AEM produce, AEM proprietary sources, but it also enables organisations to connect their own external data sources and include those in the process, in the resilience planning process. Um, it'll also integrate with most other environmental data sources for you know, a consolidated view of all the relevant hazards and risks, uh, configurable too, importantly, configurable to suit each organisation's processes and needs. Because that local configuration, so how your organisation needs to have this information, which sources it needs and how it brings it together, that's important for them to configure because we can't know that for all of them, right? So this is going to span real-time monitoring of weather, flood, lightning, wildfire ignition detection through to forecast and predictive layers and that long-term risk planning piece that I talked about in the wildfire example earlier on. And it's going to do all of this with the ability for organisations to then upload and manage their own assets. So, so far, we've talked about just sort of hazard information, risk information, and, and real-time environmental information. To really unlock the benefits of this, organisations need to then put their own assets into that picture, and they need to be a part of the decision-making process and the planning process. Right? So Element360 is going to enable that uh, ease of upload and management of an organisation's own assets and the ability to define those risk activities in relation to those assets, all in the one place. But perhaps most importantly, we're really working hard to ensure that the collaborative and the sharing features that we talked about um, are going to genuinely support that resilience concept that we talked about, collaborative resilience. Because without that, it's just a fancy version of you know, risk analysis for me. And really, to solve this problem, it has to be about common risk analysis for us, so other organizations as well as ours, and doing it collectively. That's great, Ben. Uh, I mean, this is exciting stuff you're talking about. Um, I, I could go on asking questions, but I mean, <laughs> we're kind of running close to the end of our time. So is there one final thought that you'd want to leave us with? I'd, I'd say that um, my key takeaway would be getting disaster resilience right is probably more important than ever. Because we're leaning into this time where we're really starting to feel uh, the effects of rapid climate change. So natural disasters, we know, are going to increase in uh, frequency and intensity. They are. We've seen it. So I don't think we can afford to rely on the status quo of each organisation doing mostly its own thing with just its own information. And the cross-organisational planning that's occurring now is happening due to goodwill and you know ad hoc. Um, so I think the takeaway would be enabling, um, you know, that, that gap to be filled, that collaboration to occur um, is, is probably my most important takeaway because disasters don't care about artificial boundaries and 
we need a solution that enables us collectively to manage resilience in a way that makes us more effective together. So Element 360 is our vehicle to do just that. That makes sense, Ben. Thank you. And with that, it is time to bring our conversation to an end. So, uh, Ben, thank you for being here. Can't appreciate, really do appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, Mike. Thank you. And to all of our listeners, thank you for tuning in. I hope our conversation helped you learn something new about collaborative resilience. And until next time, this is Mike Nichols for AEM and Talking with the Experts. Mm-hmm.